It's good to see each one of you here. I know that some of you have not been here the last couple of weeks. And so, you know, if you are ever watching television and you think you've got a really good show and then all of a sudden you notice that the time is almost gone and you're wondering how it's going to end and then the first thing you know pops on the screen to be continued. And you get disappointed. Well, if you happen to be watching the second part, you wonder what happened in the first part. And you're trying to piece it all together like a puzzle. And so since I realized that some of you were not here the first couple of weeks, I'm going to give a little bit of review, but it's going to be brief review. And then we're going to go into the message of today. Uh, so I, I want you to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, if you would, uh, go to John chapter 4. And in John chapter 4, we find the story of the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4. And I need to pray before I really get started here. Father in heaven... Time has been rolling by, and yet your word needs to be proclaimed. Lord, make my words efficient and acceptable to you, but also, Lord, I pray that they will be enough said that people will be able to catch the concept of what you would have us to, to learn today. May your Holy Spirit be our real teacher. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus with the disciples were passing through Samaria and they came to a place called Jacob's Well. And uh, it was about noon and the disciples decided to go into the town and uh, get something to eat. Jesus sat at the well, and at, the, at that time, a woman came out to draw water from the well. And Jesus, most of you know the story, he told her uh, a few things about her. As they're sitting there talking, uh, he says, you, you know, woman, you have had five husbands, and the one that you're with right now is not your own. And uh, you know the story? And so actually what happens is uh, eventually he says, would you give me a drink of water? And, and she says, well, what do Samaritans have to do with Jews? And uh, so she's also thinking about what he has said and how he knows so much. Uh, she, she begins to perceive that maybe he's a prophet or something. And so... Uh, the woman says in verse 19 of John 4, she says uh, to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And uh, then she goes on to kind of change the subject. You know, if, uh, if, if you're living in adultery, you do not want everyone's attention drawn to that. So you want to change the subject. If you smoke cigarettes and you are convicted that it's harmful to your health, and uh, you really need to make a change in your life, you do not want to talk about the subject of cigarettes. If you drink alcohol and you know that you're not in your full uh, uh, composure when you do that, you don't want to hear it. You probably know better than anybody else what it does to you. Uh, if you overweight and uh, you, you hate it whenever somebody comes up to you and say, hey, look at you, you fat person, you, you need to lose weight. And you don't like that. And so this woman, all of a sudden, she's really being convicted. She doesn't like what he has had to say. And so uh, she changes the subject. She says, uh, well, us Samaritans, we worship over on Mount Gerizim, but you Jews worship over there in Jerusalem. And Jesus replied to her. She says, he says in verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour comes and you shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. He says, uh, the hour cometh and now is 
when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And then he goes on to say, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It is important that whenever we come to worship God, that we worship in spirit and in truth. It's not necessarily uh, the ritual that we do. It's not necessarily the place where we go to worship, but it is that we are worshiping God who is spirit, who is not finite like we are, who is above and beyond what human could ever think or perceive. And I'm going to tell you, whenever we stand before God, we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, Jesus said in Matthew uh, 22, 29, he says, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And so it's important that we realize that when we worship, we must worship in truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. Jesus is the word. And whenever we spend time in the word, we're spending time with Jesus and we're worshiping in truth. And when we talk about spirit, sometimes we need to get into the spirit of things. And we need that the Holy Spirit helps us to understand because the scripture says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so we need help that way as well. So when we worship, that's the way that we, we really need to worship. Now, that was a couple weeks ago that we talked about that. Last week, we talked about the first time the word worship is mentioned in the Bible. The first time that it is mentioned is when God told Abraham to go up to a mountain and to worship him. He says, you go over to the mountains and you worship. Now, last week we learned that Abraham had not really trusted God. You know, whenever uh, a famine came up in the land of Israel and Abraham and Sarah decided that they would go down into Egypt because they heard that there was a little more food down that way, Abraham began to get afraid because you know what? Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And so he was afraid that if he went down there, those Egyptian guys, especially the king, might want his wife. And if they knew that he was the husband, they might just kill him and take her. And so he thought he was devising a great plan. The plan was that uh, when anyone asked, Sarah, you're my sister. And so in a way that was true because from his father, from a different mother, she was his half-sister, but more importantly, she was his wife. And for him to say, she's my sister, when she's really his wife now, then he was deceitful. And sometimes whenever we tell only a half-truth, we get in trouble. Uh, someone says, if it's only half truth, the other half must be a lie. And so we find that Abraham did not trust God. God told him that he was going to be all right. God told him that uh, between him and Sarah, they would have a child. And through their child, uh, there would be many nations that would come about. Amen. And God would bless him as the number of the stars of heaven. God would bless him. But Abraham did not believe. And because he did not believe, him and Sarah began to think again, how can we devise a plan that we can really accomplish what God wants done, but do it our way? I think about a singer or two that whenever it came to the end of their life, they sang the song, I did it my way. And I'm going to tell you something, doing it my way is not the important way. Doing it my way as the pastor is not the important way. Doing it God's way is what's important. And so Abraham, he had already proven that he was not to be trusted. And God wanted to give him another opportunity to be trusted and for him to trust him. And so, uh, you know, what happens? You know, whenever we disobey God, 
and we disappoint God, you know what happens? God gives us another chance. How many times are we to be forgiven? One person said, well, the, you know, the Jews are pretty good people. They forgive three times. You know, I, I'll forgive you three times, but boy, after three times, don't expect me to do it again. And then Peter thinking, well, I'm really good at that. I can do it seven times. And what did God tell him? Seven times not enough. Seven times 70. And let me tell you, if you forgive someone 490 times, you've already forgotten to keep count. You lost count during the procedure. And so God gives us another chance. Abraham had another opportunity. And so he told Abraham, I want you to come to the mountain and to worship me. And so Abraham, uh, he's, he was told by God, very specific instructions. I want you to, I want you to take uh, some wood. I want you to take Isaac with you. In fact, Abraham, I'm going to ask you to do something that I have never really asked anybody to do before. I want you to, when you get to the mountain, I want you to offer Isaac there on the altar. And now I'm going to tell you that had never seemed possible for anyone to say anything like that about the worship of God. You know, a Christian person is not going to offer their child as an offering. You know, the Canaanites did that. Uh, you know, very early in the beginning, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, uh, God gave them uh, clothing and he gave them an opportunity to give an offering. Uh, and that offering, that offering was like a lamb without spot and without blemish. And that offering was to represent Christ. And it pointed forward to the day when Christ would one day come and he would die for them. And so uh, an offering was to be given for sins. And that little lamb represented Christ. But in the Christian faith, God had not called upon anyone to give their own child on the offering plate. But you know what happens? Some of those that begin to get further and further away from God, some of the descendants of Cain, you know what they begin to do? Some of them, you know, Cain on the altar, he offered fruit and vegetables. But later on, some of his descendants offered pig and a few other unclean things. And God never accepted the unclean. But I'm going to tell you that the Canaanites, they got more and more emboldened to do what they were doing. And it wasn't long until uh, one wife wasn't enough. They had to take two wives. And, you know, as you get encouragement from what somebody else is doing, you know, they did it and got by with it. Maybe I can do it and get by with it. And you know what? Uh, that probably is what led Abraham to think I can take Hagar as well as Sarah. It was a Canaanite custom, not a godly custom. He had not trusted God. And so God was going to test him. And so he says, go to the mountains. And so Abraham had two servants to help him. They saddled up the donkey and they piled the wood on the donkey and, and they're, they're going. And, you know, every night on their journey, Abraham, oh, what have I gotten myself into this time? Oh, God, you can't ask me to do that. And every night I believe that Abraham was up all night. His mind was troubled. It's amazing how much something can trouble you sometimes. It's so easy to get distracted. I made a payment on a bill I had. And you know what they did? That bank cashed a check, but not for the amount of the check that I wrote. And guess what that caused me? Uh, lots of headaches. I have been back and forth to that bank I made many trips in order to get that corrected. All because of one little mistake that they made. 
let alone mistakes that I make sometimes. You know, whenever somebody else makes some mistakes, it troubles me. But whenever I make them, it troubles me even more. And every night he was not sleeping. They went on three days journey. And as they were approaching the mountains, one of the things that happened there at the mountains was there was this kind of a cloud hanging over this one particular mountain. And God was showing Abraham kind of as a sign, this is the mountain, it's Mount Moriah, where you're going to go and you're going to offer uh, Isaac. So he goes up there and uh, the two servants stay behind. In fact, whenever they left the two servants behind down the hill a little ways, Abraham says to the servants, uh, the lad and I are going to go up on the mountain and worship but we will come again. He said, we will come again. That was an act of faith. Now, Abraham's thinking that uh, even if I kill my son, God can resurrect him. How else can he have many nations unless my son lives? And he had faith to believe that through his son that there would be many nations. And so he began to trust God. And so even though he didn't want to do it, he went up on the mountain. And just as he was about ready to, to offer Isaac, the Lord stayed his hand. But also, but, you know, Isaac was willingly, Isaac had gone with Abraham and other places where important events had happened and gone with him. And they had built altars in several places and they had sacrificed because of what God had done for them. And you know what? Uh, Isaac willingly crawled up on that altar, trusting not only God, but trusting his father. And he willingly lay there on top of the wood as though he was going to be killed and burned. And yet, that's not what happened. God held the hand of Abraham. And as he held the hand of Abraham, what happened was, is that there was a lamb or a ram that was caught in the thicket right close by. And God himself provided that ram to be killed. And the Bible says that God himself supplies the sacrifice. You see, Jesus died on the cross for us. That's supplied by heaven itself. It's not supplied by us. And so whenever we worship, we worship God as an act of faith. It's an act of faith. And so I want you to know something that took place there on that mountain. Abraham thoroughly repented of his sins. And he pleaded to God and God accepted his sacrifice. Not Isaac, but his faith. The Bible says in Hebrews that what Abraham did, it was accounted unto him as righteousness. It's in Hebrews 11. And so I'm telling you that our, when we enter into worship as an act of faith, we can please God. But when we enter into worship not as an act of faith, you'd be amazed at what could go wrong. I want to tell you, if you have named Jesus as your personal Savior... You need to name him as your personal savior every day. The day that whenever I first realized that I'm uh, awake and aware of something, even before I open my eyes in the morning, the first order of business should be Jesus come into my life. And you know what? Sometimes I don't do that. And you know what? Those days I don't do that are the days it seems like trouble happens. But whenever I continually ask Jesus to come in and be first and foremost in my life, then, then I can enjoy the blessings that God has to offer. We in this church, we want our worship service to be acceptable unto God. 
We don't want it to be just like the world does in most churches. We want it to be acceptable unto God. It was beginning to be noticed that we were a little bit loud and noisy. Uh, I, I want to tell you, if you hear some noises of maybe a baby crying, I know I don't have a problem with that. If you hear somebody translating the message, I don't have a problem with that. If you see someone texting the, 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 the scripture to somebody else that not available here today and they're texting the scripture, I don't have a problem with it. If you see someone texting uh, about worldly things, then I do have a problem with that because they're not with us. And as the commercial says, only about five seconds taking a look off the wheel and it may mean your death in somebody else's. So we need to pay attention to what we're doing. We need to pay attention. We need to give God his full service. So today, if you looked at the bulletin and you noticed the sermon title, and I know it's getting uh, toward the end, and I, what I've done is review, but let me tell you, I only have a really short point to make. Uh, you noticed that the sermon title today was Worship from Afar. Worship from afar. Well, the first place I see in the Bible where it says that uh, a group of people are to worship is in um, Exodus chapter 24. And so I want you to go to Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to try to hurry here. Maybe I need to talk faster. But Exodus 24, here's what it says in verse 1. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship you afar off. So uh, let, me, let me kind of tell you what has happened. The Israelites had escaped from the bondage of Egypt. And as they escaped, they were out into the wilderness. And no sooner had they gotten into the wilderness until there were people that were murmuring and complaining and all kinds of things. But there were also individuals that were looking back and seeing how God had blessed them in the past. And those individuals that look back and see how God has blessed them in the past, they have a bright future ahead of them. Because it's only as we forget how God has led in the past can we go forward. We, 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 we must not forget, you know, there were individuals that began to sing. And in Exodus chapter uh, 13, uh, chapter 15, Exodus 15, you find that there's a song of Moses. And they begin to sing and they sing of their experiences. And, and, and you find, you, you even find this text. And this, this is a text that a lot of people come to and they try to defend what they're doing in church because of this text. But I want you to notice something in Exodus 15 verse 20. It says, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand and all of the women went out after with her. Uh, with tremble and with dances, and Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath been thrown into the sea. That's speaking of the experience of, of them getting out of bondage. But when this was taking place, the, the leaping for joy because I'm so happy we're no longer in bondage, yeah. and that dance was not in church. But it was a blessing to do it. And it was a reminder that God had been leading them. And so just because Miriam danced before the Lord does not mean that we need to necessarily break out in dancing in church. Can't go there yet. It was a victorious song that they sang. But I want you to notice what happened in this worship of the congregation uh, as, as a group. When we're talking about coming to worship in this church, we're talking about corporate worship. We're talking about worship as a congregation. We're talking about not just my worship to God, but your worship to God, all of our worship to God. And I want you to notice what took place. In Exodus 
24, what takes place is that Moses, he goes on up. He goes on up. It says, Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but thou shalt not come nigh, neither shall the people go with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice all the words which the Lord had said, we will do. Now, here you got Moses, verse 1. You got Aaron and his two sons. And you got the 70 elders of Israel that are all called to worship. But out of the entire crowd, only one goes near God. Only one. And uh, as I begin to notice here, the congregation basically is left down in the valley. And while they're left down in the valley, in verse 14, it says, He said to the elders, Tarry you here for us until we come again to you. Behold, Aaron and her are with you. So actually, when Moses went on up near to God, Aaron goes back down as an administrator to be with the congregation to tell them instructions as to what they can do to worship. And you know what? The 70 elders that went along on the trip to the mountain there, that 70 elders, I don't know whether you remember the story or not, but uh, in uh, uh, actually in Exodus 18, whenever it talks about uh, Jethro, the Midianite priest, uh, the father-in-law of Moses, uh, watched Moses one day as he was sitting in judgment. He was sitting at the seat and the Israelites would come before him and all day long they would go in and go out and go in and go out. And you know what? Moses was sitting there early in the morning, late at night and Jethro says to him, hey Moses, this thing that you're doing, it's too much for you. You need to share the burden. We've been talking about in this church of sharing the burden. It's not right that one individual does all of the deaconing. It's not right that one individual does all of the cleaning. It's not right that we don't share the responsibilities. It's not right that one family gives all the offering and the other families just coast through. You understand what I'm saying? We need to share the responsibilities. And so Jethro says to Moses, it's not right that you do all this by yourself. And so you know what happened there in Exodus chapter 18? Uh, in Exodus 18, as he said that, uh, he says, choose some individuals that can help you. And so we find in Exodus 18 in verse uh, uh, 20 uh, and 21, he gives a little bit of the uh, requirements for these 70 that's going to help him to judge. One of the things it says in verse 21 of Exodus 18, it says uh, you, you need to have people that are able to do the job. You need to have people that are fearful of God or that reverences God. You need to have people that are people of truth. You need to have people that hate selfishness. And you know what? Those individuals were chosen. And so they went and they helped. Now, all of this time, they're not directly really, really close to God. Only Moses goes up into the presence. Only Moses. Over the years, our worship services have evolved more and more differently than what they were originally planned. In the very beginning, it was just a matter of coming to the Lord and humbling yourself before Him, repenting of your sins. God accepted that as you worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Then later on, more and more were called together and more and more began to do things and, you know, more and more things were used. You know, whenever you come to Luke chapter 4, when you find the habit of Jesus, the habit of Jesus, it does not say that Jesus stood before the congregation and sang hymns. It's not what it says he did. He wasn't the song leader. Now, wait a minute. 
It says that he read scripture and he also explained scripture. But it says something else that he preached the acceptable year of the Lord. We found with the, we found with the Samaritan woman that she absolutely believed in the Messiah to come. And whenever she had that belief, as a result of her belief, she brought people to Jesus and then they believed because of Jesus' words and not because of hers. What it says in John 4. So here's what, I'm, here's what I'm telling you today. Today, we're on this side of the kingdom and we're a distance from God. And I'm going to tell you the one reason why we're still here and we're not in heaven, it's because of our sins. And so all of our worship today, among all of us, all of us, we are not in the kingdom yet. But we are in this place as an act of faith we came here as an act of faith. We came here, I hope, I hope you came here seeking for forgiveness of sin. I hope you came to this place to meet up with Jesus. I hope you came to be instructed by Jesus. I hope that as you came to this place, whatever means God has provided, uh, that we will lift up Christ. And so... What happened there was they began to worship down in the Valley of Far. But you know what? When God gave the commandments to Moses up there on that mountain, that's whenever he was worshiping. Whenever he gave those commandments up there on the mountain, you know what the very first commandment was? Thou shall have no other gods before me. In one text... The Bible says God's name is jealous. And I think that's in Exodus 34. His name is jealous. He is a jealous God. He does not desire that you worship him in any other way other than him. And so whenever I'm thinking about why we worship afar is because we're not quite there yet. You know, sometimes whenever I sing, it's not quite like it ought to be. I found myself just the other day singing a song while I was in my car by myself. And the first thing you know, the words came out wrong and it made me almost make me think that I was God and he was the one to serve me. I got mixed up on the words. Don't tell me I'm the only one that's ever done that. You've gotten mixed up too. And don't tell me that the children of Israel did not get mixed up. Because you see, while Moses was up there in the presence of God, many of the congregation were down there worshiping the golden calf. But God calls us. He calls us from afar. We worship from afar. And the closer we get to God, the more clean our heart is. And so one of the reasons I come to this place is so that I might get a clean heart and that God might renew a right spirit within me so that I can worship in spirit and in truth. Now, music came along with the worship. Uh, you know what? In the last five chapters of the book of Psalms, it talks, David says we need to come into the congregation of the Lord and it says that we should come with our musical instruments and with our voices and we should sing and we should glorify God. We should bring praises to him. But let me tell you something. Praising is not worshiping. Did you get what I just said? Praising is not worshiping. Worshiping is to be totally connected. Praising is sometimes flattery. And sometimes in our service, we see flattery. So you know what we decided to do? We're going to fast a little bit so that we can kind of think about it and get it right. Amen. That's, why we, that's why we've done this. Now, we're going to be back with music next week. Now, the danger next week is that we might flatter man. And I hope and I pray that we will not be flattering man next week. Now, I have had people tell me since we've been doing this, well, we, we, we miss the music. 
Yeah, so do I. Uh, but it's important that we sing it right. I was uh, taking a fine arts class in college. Found out later I didn't really need to take it. I'd already gotten a degree from Oklahoma State University in engineering, so when I went to study for theology, I didn't need to take all of the basic stuff because I already had a degree. And so, uh, but my advisor says, you need this fine arts class in music. I found out later that that was an elective that I didn't need after I took it. But I learned something in that class. I think it was by God's design that I went to the class, even if I did sleep through half the class. <laughs> you know, music, some of that uh, Bach and Beethoven will put you to sleep. And, uh, you know, during that musical class in the afternoon, I was working full time. I was taking 23 semester hours. And, uh, uh, you know, I had a family. We already had our two daughters. And let me tell you, my day, there was not, there was only four hours lay down time during the week. And let me tell you, when I had to go to that afternoon class, I hated it because I was so sleepy. John, I was sleepy. A while ago, I was praying, by the way. He thought I was asleep while ago. Let me kind of bring this to an end. What I learned in that class was we can all sing a tune. It may not be the tune that somebody else sings. There's some verses or some songs that we can't sing too well. And sometimes whenever we sing, if we do like Moses and, and like Miriam did, we'll sing of our experiences. And sometimes we need to get it in our heart. Uh, now, I'm not a singer, but do you remember one of the texts where it says in Psalms, thy word is a lamp into my feet? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. All right, I'm going to stop at that one because I thought we were fasting. Uh, I am going to do one more though. And I want, to, I want to tell you by using this what we can do with music if we really are of a mind to. I want you to go with me to Proverbs chapter uh, 20. Proverbs 20, verse 13, closing text. And I'm sorry I've been long. Proverbs 20, verse 13. I'm going to repeat this once. And then the second time around, you can join me in repeating it. Proverbs 20, verse 13. Love not sleep. Love not sleep. Lest thou come to poverty. Lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes. Open thine eyes. And thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Do it with me. Love not sleep. Love not sleep. Lest thou come to poverty. Lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes. Open thine eyes. And thou shalt be satisfied with bread. And you can do the crescendo. Proverbs 20. Whatever it takes to remind you of God's word can turn out to be a tremendous blessing for you. I don't care. You don't have to sing it the same way I did. You don't even have to sing it. If you don't sing it, at least read it. You remember what it said in Revelation? Blessed is he that Heareth and readeth and keepeth those things that are said. You see, we want to worship God because true worshipers 
worship in spirit and in truth. And they worship out of the heart because their heart has been given to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we went a little long, but the food is close by. Pray that you bless the food, bless the fellowship after the service here. We pray that you somehow or another, those individuals that missed the first two messages on this worship, that they might be able to fill in the blanks. Lord, we pray that today that we would realize that the reason why we're still worshiping from afar is because it is our sin that has separated us from God. So we worship from afar. But even from afar, you're there. Jesus said, last phrase of verse in the verse of Matthew, Lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world. May we take Jesus with us, Lord. In his name we pray, amen.